Well, beloved uh, congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, please turn with me in the Word of God to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we are going to join our Lord Jesus Christ here in verses 25 through 34 near the tail end of his Sermon on the Mount. And, and Christ has a word uh, about anxiety for us this morning. Uh, I'm sure all of us have experienced varying uh, degrees of anxiety throughout our lives. Sometimes anxiety is fairly general, but at times anxiety can, can grip us and almost overwhelm us, as it were. And, and I'll say before we read the passage that there is some dispute uh, over this passage as, as to what Christ is really after here. Is this just a blanket prohibition against anxiety? Is that the main point of our passage? Or is, is the thrust of our Savior's words and His tone geared more toward a comfort and exhortation to those who are anxious about the future? And I think it's the latter, and my hope for us is that as our passage is read and preached, that you wouldn't hear just a blanket command against anxiety, but that you would see here how Christ's exhortation is, is shot through with, with wonderful promises about God and God's character, about God's awareness and God's care for, for us, His anxious people. And so may these verses not be a burden to you who are anxious, but more of a ballast uh, to, your, to the sale of your souls. So we're going to consider our passage really in three points. Uh, verses 25 and following, we're going to consider our anxiety about life, about life and the things of life. Secondly, there in verse 26, we want to consider our value to God. We have great value to God. And then finally, there in verses 33 and following, we want to look at our orientation to glory. So our anxiety about life, our value to God, and our orientation uh, to glory. Let us seek the Lord's blessing upon us in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word that you don't merely command us but so often when you do command us, you provide for us promises and great truths about your character and your love and your grace. And so, Father, speak through your word as it's read, as it's proclaimed, that you might indeed guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. I think the liturgy may go up to verse 33, so just hang with me. I'm going to read up through verse 34. Hear the words of the living God. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Verse 34, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People of God, do not be anxious about your life. Do not be anxious about your life. It's easier said than done, isn't it? There's a story um, about this guy who struggled with anxiety, and he figured, you know, I'm going to hire someone to do my worrying for me. <laughs> so he interviews a bunch of people, finds a guy who thinks he's going to be fit for the job, and 
decides to hire him for, for $200,000 a year. That's what they agreed to. And, and his new employee who was hired to do his worrying comes to him and said, Sir, how are you going to pay me that $200,000? The guy says, hey, you know, that's for you to worry about. <laughs> You know, it's been said about anxiety. Anxiety is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you very far. And anxiety, as you know, it, it can sometimes get us pretty far, can't it? At times, anxiety can drive us more and more farther and farther within to ourselves. Anxiety can at times drive us farther and farther into some imaginary future that hasn't happened and, and may never happen. And in doing so, our anxiety can often drive us farther and farther away from God. You know, some statistics on anxiety, some percentages on anxiety for us this morning. 40% of anxiety is about things that will never happen. 30% is about things in the past that can't be changed. Here we get to the nitty-gritty here. 12% is related to criticism by others, which mostly is untrue, or perhaps for some of you it's all untrue, right? (laughs) 10% is about health, which of course only gets worse with stress and anxiety. (laughs) And that last 8% is about real problems that will need to be faced. And so I ask you this morning, dear Christian, what is it that makes you anxious? What is it that you value, that you love, and and that you desire, that you hope in, that, that is causing anxiety for you today? Now, of course, it's Jesus who says these words, who issues the command here, don't be anxious about your life. And we might think, well, Jesus, you sinless incarnate son of God, you, it's easy for you to say such things. It's easy for you to command such things to your disciples and to us. You, you're the sinless incarnate son of God after all. And so when you think of Christ's words here, what is he truly after, beloved? Well, Christ is after nothing less than our very lives. You see here that Jesus is after a direction, an orientation, a movement of our lives, of our minds and our hearts away from anxiety towards seeking the kingdom and the righteousness of God. And Christ's words here come within the broader context of the Sermon on the Mount. And this exhortation against anxiety comes to us on the heels of a reminder that we ought not to store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but rather treasures in heaven. And Jesus has just warned us that we, we, we can't serve two masters. He's told us that we can't serve both God and, and money. And so now our Savior turns to an exhortation about anxiety over the things that money can buy. You see, Christian, money's merely a tool. It's a tool. You use it to get other things. Money is a tool, but it's not an end. And Christ wants us to be oriented toward ends, toward the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God. And so Christ deals here with the things and the goods that money can buy. Note there verse 25. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? You see, money can buy these things. Money can buy a lot of these things. Money can buy very nice versions of these things. And yet, Christian, it is God who ultimately provides these things for you. It is God who provides for you the bare necessities of life. Now, we, of course, we live in a different culture, don't we? It's probably been quite some time in our nation. Not too many of us have been all that concerned about the basic and bare necessities of life, but times are changing, aren't they? And times are changing fast. Things are getting more expensive. Certain goods are becoming more scarce. And so, Christian, what are you to do about the future? Well, you're not to be anxious. (laughs) That's why I love the Lord's Prayer. We are not to be haughty, And to presume to be presumptuous on the bare necessities of life, nor are we to preclude God from the picture. We are to pray for them. We are to trust God to provide our daily bread, and as we receive it, we are to give thanks for it. 
And you know what happens as we do that? We realize something about our God and Father. My little son, Matthew, he loves to say grace at our house. This is a very similar prayer each and every time. You know, he's just turned five. And he says, Father, always when we pray, we pray when we eat food. <laughs> and I think about that. And, and that's one of his first memories. Apparently his enduring memory, isn't it? And it's God's provision over meals. It's God's provision of food and drink, and that's good because Jesus said we ought not to fret or to think that God doesn't know. God knows we need these things. I know that, Christian. You know that. God knows you need these things. But knowing doesn't always keep us um, and stop us from worrying, does it? (laughs) You might say, well, Pastor, you know, I'm not anxious, I'm just a little concerned. As I look around, as I look to the future. Well, you see what the Savior says in verse 31. He says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. You know, whether you call it concern, which is maybe sanctified anxiety, right? Or or anxiety that grips you. When we go around in our minds preoccupied, or overly concerned about the future. Christ's point here is that, is that if, we, if we, we go around, in a sense, muttering all these questions about food and drink and, and the future, whether we do it out loud to whoever will listen, or whether we just we ruminate on these concerns in our souls and, and it kind of wears us out, we're living, in a sense, like those without God. He says, like the Gentiles. And let me say by way of application, you know, some people are going to be more anxious than others. It's a fact. I've been reading a book about trauma and nurture and abuse. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. And everyone is different. Different trauma, different genetics, different experiences in the home with mom and or dad. And we, we are all this amazing integration of body and soul. And, and the body keeps the score sometimes in the sense, you know, you know when you've been around someone, they're just the worst. It sounds unchristian to say, but your, your heart's racing, you know, you got to go meet them in a room and you're worked up and the body's ratcheted up. Like some people have had unique experiences. It's not always a a measure of their holiness or their sanctification. Everyone's going to be different. Some more anxious than others. You know, I I, I, uh, really squeamish when it comes to medical procedures. Some back pain a couple years ago and I had an epidural plan for Monday and I'd preached that Sunday on how Jesus is up on the mountain and the disciples are in the lake and there's waves and everything and Jesus is overseeing it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to... Jesus is overseeing this procedure. I'm going to go in and it's going to be fine. And uh, I almost passed out. My heart rate was dropping there, slapping me on the face. My heart rate was like down to 10. It took me like two hours to recover. Beth had to pick me up. And I had to get some blood work done just a couple weeks ago. And so I'm like, okay, how's this going to happen, right? I don't want to die. Like, you're like, your pastor, you're out of control. Yeah, I got a problem. I admit it. Some anxiety there, Okay. So we waited till the family was in town so they could watch the kids and Beth would go with me. I just wanted to witness there in case I died so they could hear like her version of the events. So they put me in this recliner, right? You know, I'm like, recline this thing all the way back, buddy. You know, I have a hard time here. He gives me the thing. They, I'm holding my wife's hand. I'm probably squeezing it off. And, you know, everything went really well. Praise God. I was like so in love with my wife, so happy she was there, you know, and we went, we went by, there was taco trucks outside, and we got some tacos, and it was a great afternoon, you know, and my phobia of needles and love of tacos, it seems so trivial, doesn't it, to, to the things that, that may be causing you anxiety today, and I say all that because when it comes to our anxiety, we really need two things, you know. We don't just need a command not to be anxious, but God has given you a community, hasn't he? He's given you loved ones. Brother, sister in the Lord, spouse, a friend in Christ, to walk with you. Don't keep it to yourself. Let them bear your burden. Ask them for help. Ask them for prayer. Ask them to walk with you through your struggles. 
You know, some, sometimes in our anxieties, we can just want to isolate ourselves. We need not just commands of Christ and Christian community, but, you know, sometimes we can leave God out of the picture. And that's our second point. We have to consider our value to God. Look at verse 26 there. Consider your value to God, beloved. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You know, God cares for the birds. I drive into my study in the mornings on Friday right there in the south lot. There's this huge pothole, and you know, it's annoying. You've got to drive around it, right? And on Friday, sprinklers were on. It's filled up with water. Guess who's in it? The birds are flocking around. It's like they have this bird jacuzzi, and they're loving life. And usually I'm like trying not to run them over and gnashing my teeth at the pothole, you know. God was caring for them. And yet you are worth infinitely more than those birds. You as one created in the image of God, the pinnacle of God's creation, God cares for you. And yet, you know, the fact that God cares for you, it doesn't exempt you from anxiety, does it? Samuel Rutherford is so good on this. Listen to what he says here. If your Lord calls you to suffering, forms of anxiety is a degree of suffering, do not be dismayed, for he will provide a deeper portion of Christ in your suffering. The softest pillow will be placed under your head, though you must set your feet bare among the thorns. Do not be afraid at suffering. The greatest temptation out of hell is to live without trials. Amen. Don't be deceived. Embrace your trials. Embrace Christ in your trials. Rutherford says, A pool of standing water will turn stagnant. Faith grows more with the sharp winter storm in its face. Grace withers without adversity. For you cannot sneak quietly into heaven without a cross since crosses form us into the image of Christ. And yet how difficult it is to bear our crosses at times. So what are we to do, Rutherford says? Lay all your loads by faith on Christ and ease yourself. Let him bear all. He can, he does, and he will bear you up. Whether God comes with a rod or with the crown, he comes with himself and says to you, I am your salvation. What a great quote. Who is this one who comes to us? But the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who during his earthly incarnate ministry said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, speaking about the cross, and how distressed I am until it's accomplished. The one who comes to you in your anxiety on the night when he was betrayed was troubled in soul. He said, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, for this hour I have come. And a few hours later, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. You recall what he says there. I am overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And yet he never sinned. Distressed, troubled soul, overwhelmed, and yet sinless. Why? Because his anxiety, if you want to call it that, his distress, his trouble, it never eclipsed his view of the goodness of God, of his perception of the Father's goodness. He was still able to commit himself to the Father's will. And what does he say here to you, beloved? Your Father knows you need these things. Christian, your Father knows all the things you truly need. The question this morning is, will you trust him? Will you trust God? Will you trust this God who is your creator, God who is the source of your life? Will you trust this God who has provided for you all your days? Will you trust the God who provided for you from your mother's womb? Who nourished you? Who kept you? who knit you together, who preserved your life in your mother's womb as you were being formed and fashioned for glory? 
Will you trust this God who then provided for you with love and tender care at your mother's bosom? Who nourished you, who comforted you, who cared for you? And this God who's provided for you throughout your childhood. I'm not saying (laughs) that your life has been a bed of roses. Some of us had difficult mothers, difficult lives. But beloved, God has guided your life. And God has provided for you each and every step of this way. And you know what? God will continue to provide for you and care for you, dear Christian, to the very end. And so you need not doubt his provision. You need not be anxious over his provision. You know, and probably the best test to see if you trust God, the best way to guard against anxiety of your life. You know, I call it the test of the psalmist. It was the psalmist who said, your love, O Lord, is better than life. That's the test. Can you say that? Your love is better than life. Can you say that when there's inflation? Can you say that when when interest rates are going up, when the home values and stock prices are going down? Your love is better. Can you say that when there's food shortages? Can you say that with the psalmist? If you can't say that today, repent. Your Father knows the things you need, beloved. You can trust God. He's trustworthy. He's faithful to you. In Christ, you have tremendous value. Think of what Rutherford said. Lay all your loads by faith on Christ. Ease yourself. We are of tremendous value to God. And yet, not only that, we are orientated toward glory. Look at our third point there in verse uh, 32 and following. We are not to be overly preoccupied with the things of this creation. We are to concern ourselves with the things of the new creation. Look at Jesus' words here. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus tells us here not to be anxious about tomorrow. Why? Because worrying or being anxious about tomorrow is carrying uh, tomorrow's load with today's strength. It's carrying two days at once. Who who is sufficient for such things? No one. (laughs) Charles Spurgeon is so good on this. Listen to what he says. Our anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows but only empties today of its strengths. You know, if you're here today and you're running low on, on strength and high on anxiety, I want to remind you, Christians, your anxiety and your fretting are not the source of your strength. The source of your strength is your God who is your strength and your song and has become your salvation. Commit all your tomorrows to him. But what are you to do today? Well, the first thing you need is some perspective. You know, anxiety in this life isn't going to completely cease. Even though we are the Lord's children, God has called us to live real life in a real world. And in this life, we will still carry at times some degree of anxiety with us. No amount of faith can fully exempt us from the remaining corruption of sin. And because of that, Jesus' words here in verse 33, if you just take them at face value at first glance, about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, they they don't seem all that relevant, do they? It doesn't seem all that practical. I mean, come on, Jesus, we're dealing with my anxiety after all. What does that even mean to seek the kingdom and the righteousness of God? I want to ask you, Christian, how, how are you known? How are you known, Christian? So often as Christians, we're known by what we refrain from doing. And the world mocks us and, you know, that's fine. We're blessed when that happens. Some other ways we are known, just as people in general, is by, is by how we respond in certain situations. When push comes to shove, how, how you respond or react can have an indelible mark on your witness, for good or bad. We've been on both sides of that, I'm sure. But Christian, my question for you is, how are you known in general? Are you known as a vessel of anxiety? <laughs> As a vessel of concern and fear, are you known as a vessel of of trepidation about the future? Or are you known as a vessel of mercy and blessing? 
I'm not making light of your anxiety. What I'm telling you is that you should be a vessel and an ambassador of blessing. This is not something you can fake. This is not something you want to try to do by gritting your teeth and and bearing it. Being a vessel of blessing comes out not perfectly all the time. It's not always appreciated. But it comes out as you seek first the kingdom of God. As you don't preoccupy yourself ultimately with all the things of this creation, but as you seek the new creation. And so seek the kingdom of God, beloved, before your priorities. Seek first the kingdom and righteousness of God before your agenda, before you try to take all your anxieties head on. And you know you can only seek first the kingdom and pursue the righteousness of God because God has first sought you, hasn't he? He sought you in Christ. And God sought you that he might save you. And to seek you, he humbled himself to take upon your flesh and blood. And he humbled himself even further all the way to the cross. He was distressed. He was troubled in soul. He was overwhelmed with sorrow. And yet he went to the cross to die for your sins and to reconcile you to God. And he beckons you today to return to him and to rest in him. And so Christian, rest in Jesus, this one who's clothed you in garments of salvation, in robes of righteousness. And he did all that not to leave you on your own devices as you struggle with anxiety. He did all that that he might live within you and through you. You know what the recipe for dealing with anxiety is. It's beauty. It's not the beauty of a nightcap before bed to take the edge off. It's not the beauty of of the false beauty of materialism. It's not the illicit beauty of lust. It's not the numbing beauty of social media or television. The recipe for anxiety is the beauty of God, the beauty of God's kingdom and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the psalmist? I want to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I want to encourage you to do that in your anxiety. Samuel Rutherford said, whenever I find myself in the cellar of affliction, you know what that's like, Christian. That seller of affliction that can cause you much anxiety. What are you to do? He says, whenever I find myself in the cellar of affliction, I always look for the fine wine. What a line. Dear Christian, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is the finest wine for your soul. And when your anxieties abound and your concerns about the future, I promise you, they will pale when seen in the light of Christ, in the light of his kingdom and his righteousness. You know, and I close in speaking about the future. No clue where we're going as a nation or as a world. But I tell you this. If there ever fails to be food and drink for you, do you know what that means? It means your time to meet Jesus is near. And everything will soon be okay. And so whether you die at the ripe old age, the body, a belly full of food and wine, or you die destitute in affliction under duress, This same faithful Christ who has saved you will seek you once again and to come to take you to be with himself at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So in the meantime, beloved, do not be anxious about your life or about the future, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And in this life, when you find yourself in the cellar of affliction and anxiety, look for that fine wine. And take refuge in Christ, your precious Savior, who loves you and who will keep you and who will provide for you to the very, very end.
And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this command against anxiety and yet the many precious promises that you value us, that you've sought us, that you've saved us, that we are bound for glory. So come what may, O Lord. May we face it with resolve and courage in our Savior each day and leave tomorrow for your care and your provision. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.